Well, we're a little sparse today. Uh, you're welcome to move up if you want to. Um, I like to write, so I'm going to do some writing on the board. Um, if you can't read it, that might also be incentive to move up. Okay, I uh, hope you got an outline. Uh, they're back there on the very back seat. If you didn't get one, uh, feel free to get up and move back there and grab one real quick. Like I said, today we're looking at John Calvin, uh, one of the most famous of the guys we're studying. Last week, Ben talked about Martin Luther. Uh, Luther is probably the most famous of the Reformation era theologians, and Calvin is probably the second most famous. So my suspicion is most of you have heard of uh, Luther and Calvin both. Um, Calvin's a famous guy, and there's a lot to say about him in 45 minutes. So let's get started. He was born in 1509. He was a Frenchman. He was born in the Noyon, I think that's how to pronounce that, region of France into a middle-class family. Uh, His dad uh, initially wanted him to study to become a minister, but later his dad got mad at the church, uh, which has happened many times in history, I'm sure. He got mad at the actions of the local parish and uh, told John, you know what, never mind, go study law. So Calvin went to the University of Paris as a teenager, which was, by the way, that was common in those days. Students went to college when they were in their teenage years. Uh, He was brilliant, but uh, he was doing what was the norm. He went to the University of Paris and learned Latin from a guy named Mathurin Cordier, who was, at that time, a world-renowned Latin teacher, one of the greatest um, classicists in the world in the 16th century. He taught John Calvin Latin and rhetoric And uh, he was trained in the classical trivium, classical education. And uh, he left Paris in 1529 when he was about 20 years old to go study law at Orleans. I know I'm butchering these, I'm not French. And Bourges. Um, And here he became intrigued by uh, the new humanism. Ben talked talked about this a little bit last week when he talked about the guy named Erasmus. Erasmus was the greatest humanist thinker in the world in that time, and he was one of Calvin's heroes as a young man. And remember what Ben said, it's very important for Calvin too. There had been a recent rediscovery of many of the classical works, uh, Aristotle, um, Plato, all the Greeks, all the Latins, uh, Latin guys from Rome and Greece. There had been a rediscovery of those things, so people were relearning the languages, and Erasmus was the world leader in that realm. It was called humanism. So Calvin became a scholar and a student of Erasmus in his very early years, in his early 20s, and he learned Greek during that period as well. So by the time he's 22, 23 years old, he's, he's mastered Greek and he's mastered Latin. And uh, at some time during this period of study, when he was studying for law, he was converted. Uh, in all of his writings, he speaks very, very infrequently about himself. Uh, Unlike Augustine, who wrote a whole book about himself, about his autobiography, Calvin, we know really very little about him from his own writings, but we do know that this conversion was sudden and that it was very powerful. Um, He writes about it a little bit. He says he was immediately struck by the majesty of God, that he came face to face with the glory of God, and his life was changed. And he writes that he was immediately inflamed with an ardor and intense desire to progress in religion. And needless to say, he did that. Uh, He did that quite well. Um, There's disagreement as to when exactly he accepted the new Reformation theology. Uh, When Calvin was born, by the way, Luther was 25 years old. So Luther's 25 years older than Calvin. So when Calvin's in his early 20s, the Reformation is just coming into full tilt, into full swing. And it's almost certain that Calvin accepted the Reformation teachings very, very early in his conversion experience. Certainly by 1530, By the time he's 21, he's become a Reformation convert. So he's studying law, studying in France. He's developed a bunch of young friends who are all Christians and who are all converts to the Reformation. And then in 1533, one of his buddies, Nicholas Cop, C-O-P, preaches a sermon uh, at the Mass in uh, the place where he lived that was very Reformed, very Lutheran, and it really ticked off the leaders Uh, the civil leaders, and also the ecclesiastical authorities of the day. And so what they did was they started persecuting the Christians there. This was, by the way, to be a very common refrain in France for the next century. And so Calvin and some of his buddies fled the country. 
And it's speculated, by the way, by a lot of people that Calvin actually wrote this sermon. Uh, there's no way to know that for sure, but uh, it's so fami- it looks so much like his later work that it's pretty clear that he had a, a, a key role in it if he didn't write it. So these senior faculty members get mad, and Calvin and Cobb and others fled the country in 1534 when he is uh, just a young man still. How old would he have been then? Uh, 25 years old. And he goes and he lives as a refugee basically for the rest of his life. Um, when he flees France for the first time, he goes to Basel, Switzerland in 1535. And the leader of the Reformation there was a famous nam- man named Echo Lampadius. Uh, if you want to name your, one of your children that, uh, that'd be encouraged by me. O-E-C, O-E-C-O Lampadius. So that guy was really famous. Calvin is in Basel for a little while, and in 1536, he publishes his first edition of what's called the Institutes, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which goes through six or seven editions in his life. The first edition in 1536 was just six chapters long. It was like a little bitty pamphlet uh, covering the basics of Christian religion. And as he grows, the final edition is published right before he dies, five years before he dies in 1559, and it is the massive institutes that we know today. So anyway, but he published the first version of the institutes in 1536 at the age of uh, 27. Uh, What a lazy slacker. And uh, anyway, he goes back to France in 1536 because the authorities have allowed the, quote, heretics back in the country for a time at that point. But they say that they're only going to let them come back for six months And then they have to decide if they're going to recant and go back to Rome or and stay in France or if they're going to do something else. So Calvin decides that there's no life for him. There's no future for him in his home country of France. And so he leaves France forever. And he intends, so basically, this is very important, by the way, in Calvin's life. Hey, Doug, welcome back, chaplain. Good to have you back. Um, Calvin, a very important thing in his life is uh, that he's a refugee. He's a pilgrim. His entire life, for the most part, he's working outside of his native land. Uh, That's going to influence his thinking a lot. So anyway, he leaves France, and he intends to go to Strasbourg, which was sort of a, it was an imperial, free imperial city in that day that was a refuge for many reformers. Uh, But on the way to Strasbourg, an army is traveling north up through Switzerland to fight this other army, and it detours Calvin in his trip. And so he has to go south because he doesn't want to run into this army because he's uh, not a popular guy in the Holy Roman Empire. So he goes south to a town called Geneva, which is in Switzerland. And while he's in Geneva, the pastor there, he intends just to stay in Geneva for one night. If you remember Augustine's story, this is remarkably parallel. Remember when Augustine went to Hippo? They basically forced him to stay there and be their pastor. Well, Calvin goes to Geneva. The pastor of the church there is a guy named William Farrell. And he hears that J.C., that's what I'm going to call him, J.C. is in town. His friends call him J.C. Um, but here, he hears that Calvin's in town and goes and tries to persuade Calvin to stay in Geneva and help him reform the church there. And he is very persuasive. He's a very forceful, strong personality, and he eventually does persuade John Calvin to stay. So Calvin sets up residence there in Geneva. He became a pastor, and he's ordained to gospel ministry in 1537 when he's 28 years old. And he immediately gets to work. He and this guy, Farrell, write a new confession of faith for the Genevan church, as well as a new liturgy for worship. And the city council, the state magistrate there, eventually, uh, originally, initially likes Calvin, and they like his work, but eventually they get mad because he has too much influence, because he holds too much sway, even as a very young man, over the city of Geneva. And so powerful council members uh, that don't like his growing influence exile him from Geneva. So he's been exiled from France, and now in 1538, he's exiled from Geneva, and he flees there, and he's gone for three years. Now, while he had been in Geneva, he had done a tremendous amount of preaching. Uh, Calvin always, throughout his life, first and foremost, is a preacher. He preached thousands and thousands of sermons. Every week, he preached three times, and then twice on Sunday, just to top it off. So five sermons a week for 20-plus years of his life. He preached for about an hour each sermon. He never used notes, because only slackers use notes. And uh, 
And his preaching was expository, verse by verse exposition of the Bible. I'll talk more about his preaching in just a minute. Anyway, 1538, he's exiled. This time he does go to Strasbourg and meets up there with another very, very famous reformer named Martin Bucer. And he's in Strasbourg for three years, from 1538 to 1541. And while he's here, he just does a remarkable amount of work. He publishes the second institute, second version, second edition of the Institutes, which is expanded. He writes his first commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans, which is published in 1540. And he does a lot of other writing and preaching while he's in Strasbourg. Another very important thing that happens to him there is he got married. He gets married to a woman named Idolette de Bure, and they had uh, their first child there in Strasbourg, but the child died two weeks after it was born. And this was obviously a very tragic thing, and Calvin writes about it a little bit, and it, it affected him very greatly. So he's there until 1541. Then in early 1541, the political climate in Geneva has mellowed out some, and also <laughs> the church is doing really badly. Uh, people are leaving the church. The teaching's not very good. You know, when you boot John Calvin out of your pulpit, you realize eventually that's probably not a good decision for church life. Uh, you want, if, if, you, if you're going to have Calvin in your town, you want him preaching. So they realize this eventually, and they invite Calvin back to Geneva. And what do you think Calvin says? Well, eventually he said, initially he said, no way in hell. That's literally what he said. No way am I going back. I'm not going back there. They already booted me out once. There's no chance I'm going back. They negotiate. Eventually, he agrees to come back for a six-month term uh, and comes back in 1541 and comes for six months, but things go pretty well, and he stays in Geneva for the rest of his life until he dies in 1564. One great story. Uh, He's been exiled for three years. And remember, I was telling you about his preaching, expository preaching, verse by verse through books of the Bible, and he gets back in 1541 and his first, you know, say, uh, 1538, the last sermon before his exile, he's preaching on Genesis 27, verses 1 through 25, and he gets back in 1541, three years later, and gets up, and he says, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 27, verse 36. So he gets right back into the very next verse immediately, so he was very committed to expository preaching. I love that story. Um, He comes back and the council, the city council of Geneva is, for this time, supportive of him. And one very important thing they do that's very important for the history of church polity is they create um, what's called the consistory, which basically is a, sort of a proto-session. It's a council of elders. Until that time, the city council had ruled both state and church. Calvin is opposed to that, and so when he comes back, he convinces and persuades them to create an ecclesiastical court, just like we have today. Our elders meet as a session. They have no uh, authority over the state, and the state has no authority over us. They rule in matters pertaining to the church. That's what the consistory was. So that was a major victory for Calvin. That gets set up, and it's composed both of lay elders and ministers, so it's It's proto-Presbyterianism. Calvin is really the father of Presbyterianism, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, So the consistory can only judge in ecclesiastical matters that don't have, they don't have any civil jurisdiction, but they do have a tremendous amount of informal influence, power, and sway in the civil world as well. Uh, So during his ministry in Geneva, the second time he's there until he dies, he preached over 2,000 sermons. As I mentioned, he preached... Initially, he preached twice on Sunday and three times during the week, but uh, because he was lazy, that proved to be too heavy a burden, and he only preached once on Sunday for for about five years after that. So I was just kidding about him being lazy, by the way. Um, In 1545, his wife, Idolette, became ill, and she was very sick for three and a half years, and she died in 1549, and he was never to remarry. And he wrote of her, she was the faithful helper of my ministry. From her, I never experienced the slightest hindrance. Um, Calvin was very affected by the loss of his wife. He was still a young man when she died, and uh, he was never to remarry. He also had a number of children, most of whom died in infancy. Um, Well, we'll, I'm going to skip the rest of that part. Um, 
So while he's in Geneva, he experiences a tremendous amount of opposition uh, from these people particularly called libertines. The libertines. And they're called the libertines because uh, of their view of Christian liberty. Uh, remember in Romans when Paul's saying, um, he's addressing the question of, if we've been saved by grace, does that mean we can live however we want? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, by no means, you've died to sin. How can you live it any longer? That's basically what the libertines believe. Calvin's preaching grace. He's preaching justification by faith alone. And so these libertines take that theology the wrong direction. And they say, because that's true, we can you know, uh, gamble, we can drink, we can have affairs, we can do all this crazy stuff. And they were doing that, and they were very powerful, well-connected, intermarried families in Geneva. And everyone knew they were doing this, and yet they kept coming to Christ's table for communion. And Calvin was vehemently opposed to this. And at one point, when it became very apparent uh, of the gross and public sin that was being committed by these people uh, in church on Sunday, they came forward for communion, and Calvin came in front of the table and put his arms around the elements and said, screamed, there is no way I'm going to let you. Basically, he said, you can pry my dead lifeless fingers off of these elements, and until then, you're not going to touch them. Um, So he felt very strongly about um, his theological convictions. Uh, That obviously did not go well, so he faced a lot of opposition from these folks uh, for a number of years. Eventually, uh, Calvin sort of gets, gets the power and gets the authority. And from 1555 till he dies in 1564, his, his influence is virtually uncontested in Geneva. And the last 10 years of his life, he did really amazing work. He sent over 100 younger ministers back to his home country, back to France as missionaries. He housed John Knox, Uh, a Scotsman who was in exile when Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, was reigning in the British Isles. And uh, Knox was influenced heavily by Calvin. Knox went back to Scotland later on and started the Presbyterian Church. Uh, So Calvin, in a very real sense, is the father of Presbyterianism. Um, He wrote the final edition of the Institutes, as I mentioned, in 1559. He built an academy for young orphans that eventually became the University of Geneva, which was for centuries a world-renowned place of higher learning in Europe. He's internationally renowned as a reformer, and his influence is spreading all over Europe. So Calvin was the father of all the Presbyterian and Reformed churches. He is our our papa in a very real sense in our tradition. So the Westminster Confession of Faith, for example, which are our uh, standards, our doctrinal standards in the PCA, as well as what's called the three forms of unity, which are the doctrinal standards for the Dutch side of things, which I know many of you are familiar with, Christian Reformed Church, URC, etc. All of those flow from Calvin's theology. Uh, So he influenced those that went to the Netherlands, those that went to Holland, and eventually wrote Confessions and the Synod of Dort and all those things. And he influenced Knox, Owen, and all the Scottish and English Presbyterian and Congregationalists that wrote uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith. So Calvin is, um, he is uh, the father of the Reformed tradition, as it were. Um, that's a really brief survey of his life. Does anyone have any questions about the life of Calvin? Anything I've mentioned? Okay, uh, there are two major works that he dedicated his life to as far as publishing goes. The first I've already mentioned a number of times is called The Institutes of Christian Religion, which is a book that's divided into four parts, and really what it is intended to do is lay out uh, the essentials, the basics of the Christian faith. And I'll tell you, it's not like Aquinas, it's not like even Augustine, it's very readable. Um, I always say Calvin goes down like chocolate milk. He's He's beautiful and wonderful to read. He was, remember, his humanism is coming out here. He's a very gifted, prosaic writer. Um, <clears throat> so I would encourage you to read the Institutes. It's a lot of work. It's long. Uh, at least read portions of it. That's something that you can handle. I know you can. It's, it's beautiful stuff. Uh, when I was um, 19 years old and 20 years old, in between, when I was in college, when I first came into Reformed Theology, I was just reading all this stuff and... Uh, Eventually, all these people are quoting Calvin, and I said, I'm just going to read the Institutes. And so I opened it up and just started devouring the Institutes, and I didn't understand a lot of it, 
Uh, but I did understand some, and I was just uh, profoundly changed and affected by reading uh, this work. Uh, it's the greatest thing that's ever been written on Reformed theology, unquestioned. That's without question. Um, so that's the first thing Calvin dedicated his life to writing. And as I said, the final edition, 1559. The other thing are his commentaries. The institutes and his commentaries are intended to go together. They were written with the express purpose that people would read his commentaries, and when they had a question about some theological matter, they would go and look that question up in the institutes. He wrote commentaries on every book in the New Testament, except for Revelation, and I really wish he had written one on Revelation, but he died before he got to it, and uh, on a lot of books of the Old Testament, the first five books, the Pentateuch, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Job, Psalms, and uh, I think that's it in the Old Testament. So, massive amount of commentary. Uh, There's rarely a sermon I preach where I don't look at Calvin's commentaries. They're still very, uh, very, very relevant for preachers even 500 years later. And uh, excellent works. You can get his entire set of commentaries for about $150. Uh, So that's something else I'd encourage you to get. (coughs) You're going to have a great library if you buy everything I tell you to buy. Okay, so... Those are the two major resources that Calvin gives us, and as I said, they were intended to complement each other. So what I want to do for the rest of our time is look at, and again, with Calvin, um, he said very important things about everything pertaining to Christian theology. So um, I've picked what I think are three or four of the most important, and things probably that Calvin is also the best known for, uh, what he wrote about. And so basically all your outline is, I know it's very small, it's hard to fit all the quotes I wanted to fit on two pages, so sorry I made it a smaller font, but um, I basically quoted from the Institutes on various subjects, and so what I want to do just for the remaining time is take us through these various topics as we have time and just look a little bit at what Calvin said about each, and hopefully you'll see how, how uh, influential he's been. So let's look first at... Uh, what Calvin said about the authority of the Bible. You'll see that there on your outline. And let me just say, um, by way of introduction, that <clears throat> this is the presupposition for all of Calvin's work. It's absolutely and utterly foundational. Uh, ben might have mentioned something about this when he talked about Luther and Aquinas, but uh, really you can say that the entire Reformation was an argument over authority. Uh, it was an argument over what bore ultimate authority? Was it Scripture along with the testimony of the church, or was it Scripture alone? And uh, the principle of sola scriptura is one that we hold very dearly in the Protestant world, the Protestant tradition, and it was a principle that Calvin, more than anyone else, developed and thought through and wrote about. So uh, just look at your outline there. First of all, he, he... he affirms there in the first quote the necessity of the Bible. In other words, the necessity of special revelation on top of general revelation, on top of what God has revealed in creation. Let's just read what he says. Without Scripture we fall into error, since his likeness, God's likeness, imprinted upon the most beautiful form of the universe is insufficiently effective. But Scripture can communicate to us what revelation in creation cannot. Since God in vain calls all people to himself by the contemplation of heaven and earth, his word is the very school of God's children. And so Calvin believed in the necessity of special revelation, the necessity of the Bible. And furthermore, he went on to say that the Bible is authoritative. And what he did in arguing for the authority of the Bible is foundational and is the best argument that's ever been made for it uh, because it's biblical and uh, it's still the argument that people use. Anytime you hear this argument, it's just really rehashing Calvin. He used this, this idea, which is very important. He said that the Bible, in its authority, is self, sorry, self-attesting. He writes all the time about the self-attestation of Scripture. And what he meant by that is basically this. If you ask the question, how do you know that the Bible is God's word? Or how do you know that the Bible is authoritative? Calvin's argument is the answer to that question is because the Bible says so. Now that sounds circular uh, because it is circular. But Calvin's point 
is that the Bible, by definition, is the highest authority. And so what the Bible says about itself, its self-attestation, is going to be foundational for how we view it. And so he would go to texts like 2 Timothy 3.16, where Paul writes, all scripture is what? God-breathed, inspired, and it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, etc. He would go to 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter writes, the Holy Spirit carried the apostles who wrote the New Testament, carried them along by his power. And he said, because the Bible sees itself as authoritative, it's authoritative. Um, The second quote there, let this point therefore stand. Scripture indeed is self-authenticated. Hence, it is not right to subject it to proof and reasoning. And this is where he, in a sense, is answering Aquinas. If you remember what Ben said about Aquinas a couple of weeks ago. He said, basically, um, the Bible is of necessity self-authenticated. For um, if it needed anyone or anything other than itself to validate its divine character, it would not be the word of God. Because then, you see, the validating source would be the higher authority. So because there's no higher authority to which we can appeal than the Bible, to learn about the authority of the Bible, we must go to the Bible. Okay, So that's what Calvin's getting at when he talks about the self-attestation of Scripture. It's a brilliant and important point that he made there. So Calvin on the authority of the Bible was uh, very, very helpful. He also, that final quote there is about inerrancy. He believed in inerrancy. Just look at the part that I, uh, the part that I uh, highlighted or put in italics. He says that <clears throat> the Bible was composed under the Holy Spirit's dictation. And then at the end, all perfection was and is contained in it so calvin's view of the bible hopefully you you see already if you have uh if you've been taught about the bible's authority before which i think most of you probably have you see how calvin is is foundational and uh, in a sense is is very formative in the way we today understand uh the bible any questions about that i know i'm really blowing through this yeah natalie Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good argue, Good good point. Nally's question is uh, basically an apologetic question. How do you persuade a, a, someone outside of the Christian faith of the self attestation of the Bible based on the argument Calvin made? I think Calvin would say, and when we talk about Van Til, I don't know if Ben's going to touch on this, but Van Til talked about this a lot. Every argument, every every argument for ultimate authority by definition, is circular, just in the way Calvin's argument was. So Calvin said, our ultimate authority is the Bible. How do we know that? Well, because the Bible says so. So if someone else says, like, for example, some analytic or analytic philosopher says, the ultimate authority in all human endeavor is reason, is my reason. Well, you would ask them, how do you know that? And he would say, because I reason, I can logically um, pursue that to its end to see that it's true. So, in other words, the reason, he, the, reason, the reason he would say that reason is ultimately authoritative, authoritative is because his reason led him to that point. So every, every argument for ultimate authority bears that same um, weight. So, you know, on the one hand, I think Calvin would say something like that, that everyone's, in a sense, in the same bind. On the other hand, I think he would also say that ultimately, at the end of the day, the only thing that's going to persuade someone that the Bible is God's word is the work of the Spirit, um, which he speaks about very often. Um, it requires, there might even be something in there in the quotes I have, it requires divine, supernatural uh, illumination of our minds to really believe that that's the case. And by the way, just as an apologetic point, that's still the case today. We have very solid arguments, uh, reason, seeking on faith seeking understanding as augustine said but the spirit work spirit's work in someone's heart is ultimately what's going to persuade them i know that's a really brief answer natalie it might not satisfy you but that's that's a great question ben
Ja. Yeah, good. Yeah, Romans 1 is what Ben's referring to there about how, you know, God has made it clear to everyone that he exists. Either they accept that by faith, which now requires supernatural work of the Spirit, or they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. The main point is they can never suppress that truth so well that they don't know deep down, because they're still God's image, they don't know deep down that God exists and that he's revealed himself savingly in the Word. Yeah. Okay, one more question or comment. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Gail makes a great point that there are many arguments for the Bible's authority. Uh, And Calvin talks about all of them in the Institutes. Uh, But he does say that none of those arguments, all of those arguments are premised on this argument. And if you fail to do that, you you go where Aquinas went. Uh, Reason becomes becomes the final say rather than the Bible. So if you take away self-attestation, you're going the route of Aquinas. Um, So that's, we could talk about this for the next 12 weeks, but I'm going to stop now. A lot of great stuff in Calvin on the authority and uh, the nature of the Bible. Okay, let's look at union with Christ. Okay, remember last week Ben was talking about Luther and his view on justification. And I thought Ben put it really well in response to Martha's question about what Luther thought of the book of James. He says that, that, that a Luther took a good and a true and an essential doctrine, justification, and he made that doctrine ultimate so that Every other doctrine had to go through the funnel of justification. Do you remember that? That was, in a sense, that's a criticism of Luther. Calvin is a corrective to that idea. And here's what Calvin did. Calvin spoke of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ by faith as the uh, central, pivotal, essential doctrine that, in a sense, ties everything else together. And so what he said was that the key is that we're united with the person of Jesus Christ. And because we're united with the person of Jesus Christ, all the benefits that Christ procured in his death and resurrection flow to us from that union. Those benefits include justification and what Ben mentioned last week and what James is fond of in his letter sanctification, that is, being made holy and being declared righteous. Both both of those benefits flow to us from our union with the benefactor. So Calvin would say that many, including Luther, separate the benefits from the benefactor. Our union with Jesus, the benefactor, is the key. Because we're united to Jesus by faith, all benefits, adoption, justification, sanctification, all benefits that Paul talks about in his letters flow from our being in Christ, as Paul says. And if you read Calvin on this, he's, all he's doing is exegeting the scripture. He's going to passages like Colossians 3 and Romans 5, Romans 6, Romans 8, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, um, Galatians 2, all sorts of passages that teach this to be the case. Uh, this is such a crucially important idea Um, I wish we had more time to talk about it. Let me read some of the quotes. Look at the first quote there. This is so important. Calvin writes, Christ was given to us by God's generosity to be grasped and possessed by us in faith. By partaking of him, 
okay, by being united with Jesus by faith, we principally receive a double grace. Very important there. A duplex gratia, a double grace. Namely, that being reconciled to God through Christ's blamelessness, we may have in heaven, instead of a judge, a gracious father. He's talking there about justification. You see that? And secondly, that sanctified by Christ's spirit, we may cultivate blamelessness and purity of life. So in other words, because of our connection to Jesus, we receive, he says, a double grace. Both justification and sanctification flow out of our faith union with the Lord Christ. That's Calvin's interpretation, particularly of of the Apostle Paul, and I think the best way to look at at Paul's theology of salvation. Uh, One more quote I want to read. The third quote there under union with Christ, I think is just very, very important. But since the question concerns only righteousness and sanctification, okay, so here he's still talking about justification and sanctification, how the two are united. Let us dwell upon these. Although we may distinguish them, Christ contains both of them inseparably in himself. So they're distinct yet inseparable benefits. Do you wish then to attain righteousness in Christ? You must first possess Christ. But you cannot possess him without being made partaker in his sanctification because he cannot be divided into pieces. Since therefore it is solely by expending himself that the Lord gives us these benefits to enjoy, he bestows both of them at the same time, the one never without the other. Now this, that's a lot to take in, but it's, it's really, really, really profound and thoughtful what Calvin's saying. He said, Christ cannot be divided into pieces. So when you make ultimate one of the many benefits that Christ gives, like Luther did, justification, you are in a sense dividing Christ into pieces. Every benefit, justification and sanctification, come to us inseparably yet distinctly through union with Christ. So that's how Calvin would resolve the supposed dispute between Paul and James in the New Testament that we talked about last week. So You know, Luther said, here's maybe a a way to look at it. Luther said that justification is the hinge on which the gospel swings. Okay, I I think that's true. Justification is the hinge on which the gospel swings. But union with Christ is the rest of the frame of the door. Okay? So union with Christ is, for Calvin, the central way that he looks at salvation. And if you read the New Testament, you'll see that's true. Just think about how often Paul says, in Christ. That, just that little phrase, in Christ. It's all over the place in every one of his letters. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. It's, it's, uh, I think Calvin's hitting on something very, very important here. So union with Christ is a key thing in, in uh, JC. Okay. Four minutes for predestination. Lovely. Yes, sacraments. I've already given that one up. Um, There's a lot of great stuff on Calvin has on the sacraments. I've got a lot of good quotes there on baptism and communion. Read those if you get a chance. We're not going to get to those today. I want to spend the rest of our time talking about uh, predestination, which Calvin is uh, very well known and been a controversial figure for. Uh, Calvin's a major. He has a major emphasis on the, the supreme and ultimate sovereignty of God in all things, and he does discuss this idea of predestination. And if you go to the Institute's book three, you'll see that his entire discussion is, is looking at the Bible and just exegeting Scripture, especially Romans 9 and Ephesians 1. Um, and I think what he says there in that first quote under predestination is very important for us to read. Let's look at that. Let them remember that when they inquire into predestination, they are penetrating the sacred precincts of divine wisdom. If anyone with carefree assurance breaks into this place, he will not succeed in satisfying his curiosity, and he will enter a labyrinth from which he can find no exit. For it is not right for man unrestrainedly to search out things that the Lord has willed to be hid in himself, and to unfold from eternity itself the sublimest wisdom, which he would have us revere but not understand, that through this also he should fill us with wonder. And this is key. He has set forth by his word the secrets of his will that he has decided to reveal to us. These he decided to reveal insofar as he foresaw that they would concern us and what? 
and benefit us. Isn't that, that's beautiful. And that's the first thing he says when he starts discussing this idea is that first of all, we can only go as far as scripture goes. And if you're trying to seek God's counsel in other ways, you're being a fool. And secondly, they're given, uh, this idea is given to benefit us. Um, very, very important. So just a couple other things uh, about what Calvin thought about predestination, uh, what it is. Look there at uh, C, the third quote. Here's his definition. We call predestination God's eternal decree by which he compacted with himself what he willed to become of each man. For all are not created in equal condition. Rather, eternal life is foreordained for some, eternal damnation for others. Here's what Calvin said, okay? God is absolutely sovereign over everything that takes place in his universe. He's the king of his universe. He has decreed everything that happens. Calvin also says, just like the Bible says, that not every person who's ever lived is saved. Uh, the Bible teaches that there is a hell. Hell is real. Okay, if both of those things are true, if God is utterly sovereign over everything that takes place and some people are not saved, then Calvin taught, and the Bible teaches, that God determines who is saved and who is not. That's what predestination means. That's why Calvin has been, uh, in history, a very controversial figure uh, because he spoke very, very forthrightly about this truth, about this biblical teaching. Um, but I, I'd encourage you again, I know we're running out of time, to, to read what he says about this. Uh, it's, it's very pastoral. Calvin's not some ivory tower theologian um, like Aquinas was, actually. Uh, Calvin was a pastor. He was a preacher. Uh, and he wrote these things to benefit those who read them. So I'd really encourage you to read these things. Um, let me read a couple more of these quotes just to finish off here. Uh, D, Institutes 3.22. By saying that, now here he's commenting on Ephesians 1 and Romans 9. By saying that they were elect before the creation of the world, Ephesians 1.4, he, God, takes away all regard for worth. Surely the grace of God deserves alone to be proclaimed in our election only if it is freely given. In other words, God's election isn't based on anything that man has done, either good or bad. Continuing, it is simply the Lord's clear declaration that he finds in men themselves no reason to bless them, but takes it from his mercy alone, Romans 9, 16. Therefore, the salvation of his own is his own work. To sum up, by free adoption, God makes those whom he wills to be his sons. The intrinsic cause of this is in himself, for he is content with his own secret good pleasure. So um, Calvin's emphasis throughout this discussion of predestination is that God is absolutely sovereign and that his decision about who he is going to save is not contingent, it's not based on anything other than his own free good pleasure, other than his own inner Trinitarian love for creation. Um, and that's what he's getting at when he says earlier in the earlier quote, you know, don't try to tread too far here, basically by asking questions like, well, why would God do this? Why would God not do this? Why would God save these and not these? Those are questions the answers of which have not been revealed to us. What has been revealed to us, according to Calvin, and I believe he's right, is that God is sovereign, that the intrinsic cause of election is in himself, and that we must be content with his own secret good pleasure. Now, for, for John, this led him to worship, and uh, I hope it leads us to worship as we enter into worship now. Uh, I'm closing on this topic. Uh, I wasn't planning to do that, but I'm out of time. I'm closing on this topic, and uh, I think it's, it's a good thing to close on as we go into worship, remembering who the God is that we, that we worship. He's the king. He's the sovereign Lord. He's the one that's in control. Uh, he deserves our praise and our glory because he has saved us, not because of any good thing we have done, but because of his mercy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for um, your work throughout history. Thank you for John Calvin, for... Uh, giving him wonderful intellectual gifts and pastoral heart. We thank you that you have used him uh, over the last 500 years to grow your church up. We thank you for the things that he wrote and uh, that they illuminate our understanding of the word of God. And we do pray, Lord, that 
as we enter into worship, uh, what Calvin taught would be fresh on our minds, that you are a good and sovereign king, that you are the authority over all things, and that you have re- revealed yourself to us in your word, that um, by union with Christ through faith, we receive all the benefits that you freely bestow on us. We don't receive those benefits because we deserve them, because we earn them in any way. We don't receive those benefits because you looked into the future and saw that we would be good people and decided to give them to us. We receive them because you have chosen in your sovereign mercy to be gracious to us. And we thank you for that, Lord. We pray that that would inflame our hearts, that it would affect our wills, that it would change our lives. And as we go to worship you now, we pray that we would worship you with joy, uh, with peace, and with great comfort knowing that you are a sovereign king who loves us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.